Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. A Room with a View by E. M. Forster Chapter 7 They Return Some complicated game had been playing up and down the hillside all the afternoon. What it was and exactly how the players had sided, Lucy was slow to discover. Mr. Eager had met them with a questioning eye. Charlotte had repulsed him with much small talk. Mr. Emerson, seeking his son, was told whereabouts to find him. Mr. Beebe, who wore the heated aspect of a neutral, was bidden to collect the factions for the return home. There was a general sense of groping and bewilderment. Pan had been amongst them, not the great god Pan, who has been buried these two thousand years, but the little god Pan, who presides over social contretemps and unsuccessful picnics. Mr. Beebe had lost everyone, and had consumed in solitude the tea basket which he had brought up as a pleasant surprise. Miss Lavish had lost Miss Bartlett. Lucy had lost Mr. Eager. Mr. Emerson had lost George. Miss Bartlett had lost a Macintosh Square. Phaeton had lost the game. That last fact was undeniable. He climbed onto the box shivering, with his collar up, prophesying the swift approach of bad weather. Let us go immediately, he told them. The signorino will walk. All the way? He will be ours, said Mr. Beebe. Apparently. I told him it was unwise. He would look no one in the face, perhaps defeat was particularly mortifying for him. He alone had played skillfully, using the whole of his instinct, while the others had used scraps of their intelligence. He alone had divined what things were, and what he wished them to be. He alone had interpreted the message that Lucy had received five days before from the lips of a dying man. Persephone, who spends half her life in the grave, she could interpret it also. Not so these English. They gain knowledge slowly, and perhaps too late. The thoughts of a cab driver, however just, seldom affect the lives of his employers. He was the most competent of Miss Bartlett's opponents, but infinitely the least dangerous. Once back in the town, he and his insight and his knowledge would trouble English ladies no more. Of course, it was most unpleasant, she had seen his black head in the bushes, he might make a tavern story out of it. But after all, what have we to do with taverns? Real menace belongs to the drawing room. It was of drawing room people that Miss Bartlett thought as she journeyed downwards towards the fading sun. Lucy sat beside her, Mr. Eager sat opposite, trying to catch her eye, he was vaguely suspicious. They spoke of Alessio Baldovinetti. Rain and darkness came on together. The two ladies huddled together under an inadequate parasol. There was a lightning flash, and Miss Lavish who was nervous, screamed from the carriage in front. At the next flash, Lucy screamed also. Mr. Eager addressed her professionally, courage, Miss Honeychurch, courage and faith. If I might say so, there is something almost blasphemous in this horror of the elements. Are we seriously to suppose that all these clouds, all this immense electrical display, is simply called into existence to extinguish you or me? No. Of course, even from the scientific standpoint the chances against our being struck are enormous. The steel knives, the only articles which might attract the current, are in the other carriage. And, in any case, we are infinitely safer than if we were walking. Courage, courage and faith. Under the rug, Lucy felt the kindly pressure of her cousin's hand. At times our need for a sympathetic gesture is so great that we care not what exactly it signifies or how much we may have to pay for it afterwards. Miss Bartlett, by this timely exercise of her muscles, gained more than she would have got in hours of preaching or cross-examination. She renewed it when the two carriages stopped, half into Florence. Mr. Eager, called Mr. Beebe. We want your assistance. Will you interpret for us? George, cried Mr. Emerson. 
Ask your driver which way George went. The boy may lose his way. He may be killed. Go, Mr. Eager, said Miss Bartlett, don't ask our driver, our driver is no help. Go and support poor Mr. Beebe, he is nearly demented. He may be killed, cried the old man. He may be killed. Typical behavior, said the chaplain, as he quitted the carriage. In the presence of reality that kind of person invariably breaks down. What does he know, whispered Lucy as soon as they were alone. Charlotte, how much does Mr. Eager know? Nothing, dearest, he knows nothing. But, she pointed at the driver, he knows everything. Dearest, had we better? Shall I? She took out her purse. It is dreadful to be entangled with low-class people. He saw it all. Tapping Phaeton's back with her guidebook, she said, Silenzio, and offered him a franc. Via bene, he replied, and accepted it. As well this ending to his day as any. But Lucy, a mortal maid, was disappointed in him. There was an explosion up the road. The storm had struck the overhead wire of the tramline, and one of the great supports had fallen. If they had not stopped perhaps they might have been hurt. They chose to regard it as a miraculous preservation, and the floods of love and sincerity, which fructify every hour of life, burst forth in tumult. They descended from the carriages, they embraced each other. It was as joyful to be forgiven past unworthinesses as to forgive them. For a moment they realized vast possibilities of good. The older people recovered quickly. In the very height of their emotion they knew it to be unmanly or unladylike. Miss Lavish calculated that, even if they had continued, they would not have been caught in the accident. Mr. Eager mumbled a temperate prayer. But the drivers, through miles of dark squalid road, poured out their souls to the dryads and the saints, and Lucy poured out hers to her cousin. Charlotte, dear Charlotte, kiss me. Kiss me again. Only you can understand me. You warned me to be careful. And I, I thought I was developing. Do not cry, dearest. Take your time. I have been obstinate and silly, worse than you know, far worse. Once by the river, oh, but he isn't killed, he wouldn't be killed, would he? The thought disturbed her repentance. As a matter of fact, the storm was worst along the road, but she had been near danger, and so she thought it must be near to everyone. I trust not. One would always pray against that. He is really, I think he was taken by surprise, just as I was before. But this time I'm not to blame, I want you to believe that. I simply slipped into those violets. No, I want to be really truthful. I am a little to blame. I had silly thoughts. The sky, you know, was gold, and the ground all blue, and for a moment he looked like someone in a book. In a book? Heroes, gods, the nonsense of schoolgirls. And then? But, Charlotte, you know what happened then. Miss Bartlett was silent. Indeed, she had little more to learn. With a certain amount of insight she drew her young cousin affectionately to her. All the way back Lucy's body was shaken by deep sighs, which nothing could repress. I want to be truthful, she whispered. It is so hard to be absolutely truthful. Don't be troubled, dearest. Wait till you are calmer. We will talk it over before bedtime in my room. So they re-entered the city with hands clasped. It was a shock to the girl to find how far emotion had ebbed in others. The storm had ceased, and Mr. Emerson was easier about his son. Mr. Beebe had regained good humor, and Mr. Eager was already snubbing Miss Lavish. Charlotte alone she was sure of, Charlotte, whose exterior concealed so much insight and love. The luxury of self-exposure kept her almost happy through the long evening. She thought not so much of what had happened as of how she should describe it. All her sensations, her spasms of courage, her moments of unreasonable joy, her mysterious discontent, 
should be carefully laid before her cousin. And together in divine confidence they would disentangle and interpret them all. At last, thought she, I shall understand myself. I shan't again be troubled by things that come out of nothing, and mean I don't know what. Miss Allen asked her to play. She refused vehemently. Music seemed to her the employment of a child. She sat close to her cousin, who, with commendable patience, was listening to a long story about lost luggage. When it was over she capped it by a story of her own. Lucy became rather hysterical with the delay. In vain she tried to check, or at all events to accelerate, the tale. It was not till a late hour that Miss Bartlett had recovered her luggage and could say in her usual tone of gentle reproach, Well, dear, I at all events am ready for Bedfordshire. Come into my room, and I will give a good brush to your hair. With some solemnity the door was shut, and a cane chair placed for the girl. Then Miss Bartlett said, So what is to be done? She was unprepared for the question. It had not occurred to her that she would have to do anything. A detailed exhibition of her emotions was all that she had counted upon. What is to be done? A point, dearest, which you alone can settle. The rain was streaming down the black windows, and the great room felt damp and chilly, one candle burnt trembling on the chest of drawers close to Miss Bartlett's toque, which cast monstrous and fantastic shadows on the bolted door. A tram roared by in the dark, and Lucy felt unaccountably sad, though she had long since dried her eyes. She lifted them to the ceiling, where the griffins and bassoons were colorless and vague, the very ghosts of joy. It has been raining for nearly four hours, she said at last. Miss Bartlett ignored the remark. How do you propose to silence him? The driver? My dear girl, no, Mr. George Emerson. Lucy began to pace up and down the room. I don't understand, she said at last. She understood very well, but she no longer wished to be absolutely truthful. How are you going to stop him talking about it? I have a feeling that talk is a thing he will never do. I, too, intend to judge him charitably. But unfortunately I have met the type before. They seldom keep their exploits to themselves. Exploits, cried Lucy, wincing under the horrible plural. My poor dear, did you suppose that this was his first? Come here and listen to me. I am only gathering it from his own remarks. Do you remember that day at lunch when he argued with Miss Allen that liking one person is an extra reason for liking another? Yes, said Lucy, whom at the time the argument had pleased. Well, I am no prude. There is no need to call him a wicked young man but obviously he is thoroughly unrefined. Let us put it down to his deplorable antecedents and education, if you wish. But we are no farther on with our question. What do you propose to do? An idea rushed across Lucy's brain, which, had she thought of it sooner and made it part of her, might have proved victorious. I propose to speak to him, said she. Miss Bartlett uttered a cry of genuine alarm. You see, Charlotte, your kindness, I shall never forget it. But, as you said, it is my affair. Mine and his. And you are going to implore him, to beg him to keep silence? Certainly not. There would be no difficulty. Whatever you ask him he answers, yes or no, then it is over. I have been frightened of him. But now I am not one little bit. But we fear him for you, dear. You are so young and inexperienced, you have lived among such nice people, that you cannot realize what men can be, how they can take a brutal pleasure in insulting a woman whom her sex does not protect and rally round. This afternoon, for example, if I had not arrived, what would have happened? I can't think, said Lucy gravely. Something in her voice made Miss Bartlett repeat her question, intoning it more vigorously. What would have happened if I hadn't arrived? I can't think, said Lucy again. When he insulted you, how would you have replied? I hadn't time to think. You came. Yes, 
but won't you tell me now what you would have done? I should have, she checked herself, and broke the sentence off. She went up to the dripping window and strained her eyes into the darkness. She could not think what she would have done. Come away from the window, dear, said Miss Bartlett. You will be seen from the road. Lucy obeyed. She was in her cousin's power. She could not modulate out the key of self-abasement in which she had started. Neither of them referred again to her suggestion that she should speak to George and settle the matter, whatever it was, with him. Miss Bartlett became plaintive. Oh, for a real man. We are only two women, you and I, Mr. Beebe is hopeless. There is Mr. Eager, but you do not trust him. Oh, for your brother. He is young, but I know that his sister's insult would rouse in him a very lion. Thank God, chivalry is not yet dead. There are still left some men who can reverence woman. As she spoke, she pulled off her rings, of which she wore several, and ranged them upon the pin cushion. Then she blew into her gloves and said, It will be a push to catch the morning train, but we must try. What train? The train to Rome. She looked at her gloves critically. The girl received the announcement as easily as it had been given. When does the train to Rome go? At eight. Signora Bertolini would be upset. We must face that, said Miss Bartlett, not liking to say that she had given notice already. She will make us pay for a whole week's pension. I expect she will. However, we shall be much more comfortable at the Vice's hotel. Isn't afternoon tea given there for nothing? Yes, but they pay extra for wine. After this remark she remained motionless and silent. To her tired eyes Charlotte throbbed and swelled like a ghostly figure in a dream. They began to sort their clothes for packing, for there was no time to lose, if they were to catch the train to Rome. Lucy, when admonished, began to move to and fro between the rooms, more conscious of the discomforts of packing by candlelight than of a subtler ill. Charlotte, who was practical without ability, knelt by the side of an empty trunk, vainly endeavoring to pave it with books of varying thickness and size. She gave two or three sighs, for the stooping posture hurt her back, and, for all her diplomacy, she felt that she was growing old. The girl heard her as she entered the room, and was seized with one of those emotional impulses to which she could never attribute a cause. She only felt that the candle would burn better, the packing go easier, the world be happier, if she could give and receive some human love. The impulse had come before today, but never so strongly. She knelt down by her cousin's side and took her in her arms. Miss Bartlett returned the embrace with tenderness and warmth. But she was not a stupid woman, and she knew perfectly well that Lucy did not love her, but needed her to love. For it was in ominous tones that she said, after a long pause, Dearest Lucy, how will you ever forgive me? Lucy was on her guard at once, knowing by bitter experience what forgiving Miss Bartlett meant. Her emotion relaxed, she modified her embrace a little, and she said, Charlotte dear, what do you mean? As if I have anything to forgive. You have a great deal, and I have a very great deal to forgive myself, too. I know well how much I vex you at every turn. But no, Miss Bartlett assumed her favorite role, that of the prematurely aged martyr. Ah, but yes. I feel that our tour together is hardly the success I had hoped. I might have known it would not do. You want someone younger and stronger and more in sympathy with you. I am too uninteresting and old-fashioned, only fit to pack and unpack your things. Please, my only consolation was that you found people more to your taste, and were often able to leave me at home. I had my own poor ideas of what a lady ought to do, but I hope I did not inflict them on you more than was necessary. You had your own way about these rooms, at all events. You mustn't say these things, said Lucy softly. She still clung to the hope that she and Charlotte loved each other, heart and soul. They continued to pack in silence. I have been a failure, said Miss Bartlett, 
as she struggled with the straps of Lucy's trunk instead of strapping her own. Failed to make you happy, failed in my duty to your mother. She has been so generous to me, I shall never face her again after this disaster. But mother will understand. It is not your fault, this trouble, and it isn't a disaster either. It is my fault, it is a disaster. She will never forgive me, and rightly. For instance, what right had I to make friends with Miss Lavish? Every right. When I was here for your sake. If I have vexed you it is equally true that I have neglected you. Your mother will see this as clearly as I do, when you tell her. Lucy, from a cowardly wish to improve the situation, said, Why need mother hear of it? But you tell her everything? I suppose I do generally. I dare not break your confidence. There is something sacred in it. Unless you feel that it is a thing you could not tell her. The girl would not be degraded to this. Naturally I should have told her. But in case she should blame you in any way, I promise I will not, I am very willing not to. I will never speak of it either to her or to anyone. Her promise brought the long-drawn interview to a sudden close. Miss Bartlett pecked her smartly on both cheeks, wished her good night, and sent her to her own room. For a moment the original trouble was in the background. George would seem to have behaved like a cad throughout, perhaps that was the view which one would take eventually. At present she neither acquitted nor condemned him, she did not pass judgment. At the moment when she was about to judge him her cousin's voice had intervened, and, ever since, it was Miss Bartlett who had dominated, Miss Bartlett who, even now, could be heard sighing into a crack in the partition wall, Miss Bartlett, who had really been neither pliable nor humble nor inconsistent. She had worked like a great artist, for a time, indeed, for years, she had been meaningless, but at the end there was presented to the girl the complete picture of a cheerless, loveless world in which the young rush to destruction until they learn better, a shame-faced world of precautions and barriers which may avert evil, but which do not seem to bring good, if we may judge from those who have used them most. Lucy was suffering from the most grievous wrong which this world has yet discovered, diplomatic advantage had been taken of her sincerity, of her craving for sympathy and love. Such a wrong is not easily forgotten. Never again did she expose herself without due consideration and precaution against rebuff. And such a wrong may react disastrously upon the soul. The doorbell rang, and she started to the shutters. Before she reached them she hesitated, turned, and blew out the candle. Thus it was that, though she saw someone standing in the wet below, he, though he looked up, did not see her. To reach his room he had to go by hers. She was still dressed. It struck her that she might slip into the passage and just say that she would be gone before he was up, and that their extraordinary intercourse was over. Whether she would have dared to do this was never proved. At the critical moment Miss Bartlett opened her own door, and her voice said, I wish one word with you in the drawing room, Mr. Emerson, please. Soon their footsteps returned, and Miss Bartlett said, Good night, Mr. Emerson. His heavy, tired breathing was the only reply, the chaperone had done her work. Lucy cried aloud, It isn't true. It can't all be true. I want not to be muddled. I want to grow older quickly. Miss Bartlett tapped on the wall. Go to bed at once, dear. You need all the rest you can get. In the morning they left for Rome. Part 2 Chapter 8 Medieval The drawing room curtains at Windy Corner had been pulled to meet, for the carpet was new and deserved protection from the August sun. They were heavy curtains, reaching almost to the ground, and the light that filtered through them was subdued and varied. A poet, none was present, might have quoted, life like a dome of many colored glass, or might have compared the curtains to sluice gates, lowered against the intolerable tides of heaven. Without was poured a sea of radiance, within, the glory, though visible, was tempered to the capacities of man. Two pleasant people sat in the room. One, a boy of nineteen, 
was studying a small manual of anatomy, and peering occasionally at a bone which lay upon the piano. From time to time he bounced in his chair and puffed and groaned, for the day was hot and the print small, and the human frame fearfully made, and his mother, who was writing a letter, did continually read out to him what she had written. And continually did she rise from her seat and part the curtain so that a rivulet of light fell across the carpet, and make the remark that they were still there. Where aren't they? said the boy, who was Freddy, Lucy's brother. I tell you I'm getting fairly sick. For goodness sake go out of my drawing room, then, cried Mrs. Honeychurch, who hoped to cure her children of slang by taking it literally. Freddy did not move or reply. I think things are coming to a head, she observed, rather wanting her son's opinion on the situation if she could obtain it without undue supplication. Time they did. I am glad that Cecil is asking her this once more. It's his third go, isn't it? Freddy I do call the way you talk unkind. I didn't mean to be unkind. Then he added, but I do think Lucy might have got this off her chest in Italy. I don't know how girls manage things, but she can't have said no properly before, or she wouldn't have to say it again now. Over the whole thing, I can't explain, I do feel so uncomfortable. Do you indeed, dear? How interesting. I feel, never mind. He returned to his work. Just listen to what I have written to Mrs. Weiss. I said, dear Mrs. Weiss. Yes, mother, you told me. A jolly good letter. I said, dear Mrs. Weiss, Cecil has just asked my permission about it, and I should be delighted, if Lucy wishes it. But, she stopped reading, I was rather amused at Cecil asking my permission at all. He has always gone in for unconventionality, and parents nowhere, and so forth. When it comes to the point, he can't get on without me. Nor me. You? Freddy nodded. What do you mean? He asked me for my permission also. She exclaimed, how very odd of him. Why so? asked the son and heir. Why shouldn't my permission be asked? What do you know about Lucy or girls or anything? Whatever did you say? I said to Cecil, take her or leave her, it's no business of mine. What a helpful answer. But her own answer, though more normal in its wording, had been to the same effect. The bother is this, began Freddy. Then he took up his work again, too shy to say what the bother was. Mrs. Honeychurch went back to the window. Freddy, you must come. There they still are. I don't see you ought to go peeping like that. Peeping like that. Can't I look out of my own window? But she returned to the writing table, observing, as she passed her son, still page 322. Freddy snorted, and turned over two leaves. For a brief space they were silent. Close by, beyond the curtains, the gentle murmur of a long conversation had never ceased. The bother is this, I have put my foot in it with Cecil most awfully. He gave a nervous gulp. Not content with permission, which I did give, that is to say, I said, I don't mind, well, not content with that, he wanted to know whether I wasn't off my head with joy. He practically put it like this. Wasn't it a splendid thing for Lucy and for Windy Corner generally if he married her? And he would have an answer, he said it would strengthen his hand. I hope you gave a careful answer, dear. I answered no, said the boy, grinding his teeth. There. Fly into a stew. I can't help it, had to say it. I had to say no. He ought never to have asked me. Ridiculous child cried his mother. You think you're so holy and truthful, but really it's only abominable conceit. Do you suppose that a man like Cecil would take the slightest notice of anything you say? I hope he boxed your ears. How dare you say no? Oh, do keep quiet, mother. I had to say no when I couldn't say yes. I tried to laugh as if I didn't mean what I said, and, as Cecil laughed too, and went away, it may be all right. 
but I feel my foot's in it. Oh, do keep quiet, though, and let a man do some work. No, said Mrs. Honeychurch, with the air of one who has considered the subject, I shall not keep quiet. You know all that has passed between them in Rome, you know why he is down here, and yet you deliberately insult him, and try to turn him out of my house. Not a bit, he pleaded. I only let out I didn't like him. I don't hate him, but I don't like him. What I mind is that he'll tell Lucy. He glanced at the curtains dismally. Well, I like him, said Mrs. Honeychurch. I know his mother, he's good, he's clever, he's rich, he's well connected, oh, you needn't kick the piano. He's well connected, I'll say it again if you like, he's well connected. She paused, as if rehearsing her eulogy, but her face remained dissatisfied. She added, and he has beautiful manners. I liked him till just now. I suppose it's having him spoiling Lucy's first week at home, and it's also something that Mr. Beebe said, not knowing. Mr. Beebe, said his mother, trying to conceal her interest. I don't see how Mr. Beebe comes in. You know Mr. Beebe's funny way, when you never quite know what he means. He said, Mr. Vice is an ideal bachelor. I was very cute, I asked him what he meant. He said, oh, he's like me, better detached. I couldn't make him say any more, but it set me thinking. Since Cecil has come after Lucy he hasn't been so pleasant, at least, I can't explain. You never can, dear. But I can. You are jealous of Cecil because he may stop Lucy knitting you silk ties. The explanation seemed plausible, and Freddy tried to accept it. But at the back of his brain there lurked a dim mistrust. Cecil praised one too much for being athletic. Was that it? Cecil made one talk in one's own way. This tired one. Was that it? And Cecil was the kind of fellow who would never wear another fellow's cap. Unaware of his own profundity, Freddy checked himself. He must be jealous, or he would not dislike a man for such foolish reasons. Will this do? called his mother. Dear Mrs. Vice, Cecil has just asked my permission about it, and I should be delighted if Lucy wishes it. Then I put in at the top, and I have told Lucy so. I must write the letter out again, and I have told Lucy so. But Lucy seems very uncertain, and in these days young people must decide for themselves. I said that because I didn't want Mrs. Vice to think us old-fashioned. She goes in for lectures and improving her mind, and all the time a thick layer of flu under the beds, and the maid's dirty thumb marks where you turn on the electric light. She keeps that flat abominably, suppose Lucy Mary Cecil, would she live in a flat, or in the country? Don't interrupt so foolishly. Where was I? Oh yes, young people must decide for themselves. I know that Lucy likes your son, because she tells me everything, and she wrote to me from Rome when he asked her first. No, I'll cross that last bit out, it looks patronizing. I'll stop at, because she tells me everything. Or shall I cross that out, too? Cross it out, too, said Freddy. Mrs. Honeychurch left it in. Then the whole thing runs, dear Mrs. Weist, Cecil has just asked my permission about it, and I should be delighted if Lucy wishes it, and I have told Lucy so. But Lucy seems very uncertain, and in these days young people must decide for themselves. I know that Lucy likes your son, because she tells me everything. But I do not know, look out, cried Freddy. The curtains parted. Cecil's first movement was one of irritation. He couldn't bear the honey church habit of sitting in the dark to save the furniture. Instinctively he gave the curtains a twitch, and sent them swinging down their poles. Light entered. There was revealed a terrace, such as is owned by many villas with trees each side of it, and on it a little rustic seat, and two flower beds. But it was transfigured by the view beyond, for Windy Corner was built on the range that overlooks the Sussex Weald. Lucy, who was in the little seat, seemed on the edge of a green magic carpet which hovered in the air above the tremulous world. 
Cecil entered. Appearing thus late in the story, Cecil must be at once described. He was medieval. Like a Gothic statue. Tall and refined, with shoulders that seemed braced square by an effort of the will, and a head that was tilted a little higher than the usual level of vision, he resembled those fastidious saints who guard the portals of a French cathedral. Well educated, well endowed, and not deficient physically, he remained in the grip of a certain devil whom the modern world knows as self-consciousness, and whom the medieval, with dimmer vision, worshipped as asceticism. A Gothic statue implies celibacy, just as a Greek statue implies fruition, and perhaps this was what Mr. Beebe meant. And Freddy, who ignored history and art, perhaps meant the same when he failed to imagine Cecil wearing another fellow's cap. Mrs. Honeychurch left her letter on the writing table and moved towards her young acquaintance. Oh, Cecil, she exclaimed, oh, Cecil, do tell me. I promise I spose ye, said he. They stared at him anxiously. She has accepted me, he said, and the sound of the thing in English made him flush and smile with pleasure, and look more human. I am so glad, said Mrs. Honeychurch, while Freddie proffered a hand that was yellow with chemicals. They wished that they also knew Italian, for our phrases of approval and of amazement are so connected with little occasions that we fear to use them on great ones. We are obliged to become vaguely poetic, or to take refuge in scriptural reminiscences. Welcome as one of the family, said Mrs. Honeychurch, waving her hand at the furniture. This is indeed a joyous day. I feel sure that you will make our dear Lucy happy. I hope so, replied the young man, shifting his eyes to the ceiling. We mothers, simpered Mrs. Honeychurch, and then realized that she was affected, sentimental, bombastic, all the things she hated most. Why could she not be Freddy, who stood stiff in the middle of the room, looking very cross and almost handsome? I say, Lucy, called Cecil, for conversation seemed to flag. Lucy rose from the seat. She moved across the lawn and smiled in at them, just as if she was going to ask them to play tennis. Then she saw her brother's face. Her lips parted, and she took him in her arms. He said, steady on. Not a kiss for me, asked her mother. Lucy kissed her also. Would you take them into the garden and tell Mrs. Honeychurch all about it? Cecil suggested. And I'd stop here and tell my mother. We go with Lucy, said Freddy, as if taking orders. Yes, you go with Lucy. They passed into the sunlight. Cecil watched them cross the terrace and descend out of sight by the steps. They would descend, he knew their ways, past the shrubbery, and past the tennis lawn and the dahlia bed, until they reached the kitchen garden, and there, in the presence of the potatoes and the peas, the great event would be discussed. Smiling indulgently, he lit a cigarette, and rehearsed the events that had led to such a happy conclusion. He had known Lucy for several years, but only as a commonplace girl who happened to be musical. He could still remember his depression that afternoon at Rome, when she and her terrible cousin fell on him out of the blue, and demanded to be taken to St. Peter's. That day she had seemed a typical tourist, shrill, crude, and gaunt with travel. But Italy worked some marvel in her. It gave her light, and, which he held more precious, it gave her shadow. Soon he detected in her a wonderful reticence. She was like a woman of Leonardo da Vinci's, whom we love not so much for herself as for the things that she will not tell us. The things are assuredly not of this life, no woman of Leonardo's could have anything so vulgar as a story. She did develop most wonderfully day by day. So it happened that from patronizing civility he had slowly passed if not to passion, at least to a profound uneasiness. Already at Rome he had hinted to her that they might be suitable for each other. It had touched him greatly that she had not broken away at the suggestion. Her refusal had been clear and gentle, after it, as the horrid phrase went, she had been exactly the same to him as before. Three months later, on the margin of Italy, among the flower-clad Alps, 
he had asked her again in bald, traditional language. She reminded him of a Leonardo more than ever, her sunburnt features were shadowed by fantastic rock, at his words she had turned and stood between him and the light with immeasurable planes behind her. He walked home with her unashamed, feeling not at all like a rejected suitor. The things that really mattered were unshaken. So now he had asked her once more, and, clear and gentle as ever, she had accepted him, giving no coy reasons for her delay, but simply saying that she loved him and would do her best to make him happy. His mother, too, would be pleased, she had counseled the step, he must write her a long account. Glancing at his hand, in case any of Freddy's chemicals had come off on it, he moved to the writing table. There he saw, dear Mrs. Weiss, followed by many erasures. He recoiled without reading any more, and after a little hesitation sat down elsewhere, and penciled a note on his knee. Then he lit another cigarette, which did not seem quite as divine as the first, and considered what might be done to make Windy Corner Drawing Room more distinctive. With that outlook it should have been a successful room, but the trail of Tottenham Court Road was upon it, he could almost visualize the motor vans of Messrs. Showbread and Messrs. Maple arriving at the door and depositing this chair, those varnished bookcases, that writing table. The table recalled Mrs. Honeychurch's letter. He did not want to read that letter, his temptations never lay in that direction, but he worried about it nonetheless. It was his own fault that she was discussing him with his mother, he had wanted her support in his third attempt to win Lucy, he wanted to feel that others, no matter who they were, agreed with him, and so he had asked their permission. Mrs. Honeychurch had been civil, but obtuse in essentials, while as for Freddy, he is only a boy, he reflected. I represent all that he despises. Why should he want me for a brother-in-law? The Honeychurches were a worthy family, but he began to realize that Lucy was of another clay, and perhaps, he did not put it very definitely, he ought to introduce her into more congenial circles as soon as possible. Mr. Beebe, said the maid, and the new rector of Summer Street was shown in, he had at once started on friendly relations, owing to Lucy's praise of him in her letters from Florence. Cecil greeted him rather critically. I've come for tea, Mr. Vice. Do you suppose that I shall get it? I should say so. Food is the thing one does get here, don't sit in that chair, young Honeychurch has left a bone in it. Pfui. I know, said Cecil. I know. I can't think why Mrs. Honeychurch allows it. For Cecil considered the bone and the maple's furniture separately, he did not realize that, taken together, they kindled the room into the life that he desired. I've come for tea and for gossip. Isn't this news? News? I don't understand you, said Cecil. News? Mr. Beebe, whose news was of a very different nature, prattled forward. I met Sir Harry Otway as I came up, I have every reason to hope that I am first in the field. He has bought Sissy and Albert from Mr. Flack. Has he indeed, said Cecil, trying to recover himself. Into what a grotesque mistake had he fallen. Was it likely that a clergyman and a gentleman would refer to his engagement in a manner so flippant? But his stiffness remained, and, though he asked who Sissy and Albert might be, he still thought Mr. Beebe rather a bounder. Unpardonable question. To have stopped a week at Windy Corner and not to have met Sissy and Albert, the semi-detached villas that have been run up opposite the church. I'll set Mrs. Honeychurch after you. I'm shockingly stupid over local affairs, said the young man languidly. I can't even remember the difference between a parish council and a local government board. Perhaps there is no difference, or perhaps those aren't the right names. I only go into the country to see my friends and to enjoy the scenery. It is very remiss of me. Italy and London are the only places where I don't feel to exist on sufferance. Mr. Beebe, distressed at this heavy reception of Sissy and Albert, determined to shift the subject. Let me see, Mr. Vice, I forget, what is your profession? I have no profession, said Cecil. 
it is another example of my decadence. My attitude, quite an indefensible one, is that so long as I am no trouble to anyone I have a right to do as I like. I know I ought to be getting money out of people, or devoting myself to things I don't care a straw about, but somehow, I've not been able to begin. You are very fortunate, said Mr. Beebe. It is a wonderful opportunity, the possession of leisure. His voice was rather parochial, but he did not quite. Then he flattered the clergyman, praised his liberal mindedness, his enlightened attitude towards philosophy and science. Where are the others? said Mr. Beebe at last, I insist on extracting tea before evening service. I suppose and never told them you were here. In this house one is so coached in the servants the day one arrives. The fault of and is that she begs your pardon when she hears you perfectly, and kicks the chair legs with her feet. The faults of Mary, I forget the faults of Mary, but they are very grave. Shall we look in the garden? I know the faults of Mary. She leaves the dustpan standing on the stairs. The fault of Euphemia is that she will not, simply will not, chop the suet sufficiently small. They both laughed, and things began to go better. The faults of Freddy, Cecil continued. Ah, he has too many. No one but his mother can remember the faults of Freddy. Try the faults of Miss Honeychurch, they are not innumerable. She has none, said the young man, with grave sincerity. I quite agree. At present she has none. At present? I'm not cynical. I'm only thinking of my pet theory about Miss Honeychurch. Does it seem reasonable that she should play so wonderfully, and live so quietly? I suspect that one day she will be wonderful in both. The watertight compartments in her will break down, and music and life will mingle. Then we shall have her heroically good, heroically bad, too heroic, perhaps, to be good or bad. Cecil found his companion interesting. And at present you think her not wonderful as far as life goes? Well, I must say I've only seen her at Tunbridge Wells, where she was not wonderful, and at Florence. Since I came to Summer Street she has been away. You saw her, didn't you, at Rome and in the Alps? Oh, I forgot, of course, you knew her before. No, she wasn't wonderful in Florence either, but I kept on expecting that she would be. In what way? Conversation had become agreeable to them, and they were pacing up and down the terrace. I could as easily tell you what tune she'll play next. There was simply the sense that she had found wings, and meant to use them. I can show you a beautiful picture in my Italian diary, Miss Honeychurch as a kite, Miss Bartlett holding the string. Picture number two, the string breaks. The sketch was in his diary, but it had been made afterwards, when he viewed things artistically. At the time he had given surreptitious tugs to the string himself. But the string never broke? No. I mightn't have seen Miss Honeychurch rise, but I should certainly have heard Miss Bartlett fall. It has broken now, said the young man in low, vibrating tones. Immediately he realized that of all the conceited, ludicrous, contemptible ways of announcing an engagement this was the worst. He cursed his love of metaphor, had he suggested that he was a star and that Lucy was soaring up to reach him? Broken? What do you mean? I meant, said Cecil stiffly, that she is going to marry me. The clergyman was conscious of some bitter disappointment which he could not keep out of his voice. I am sorry. I must apologize. I had no idea you were intimate with her, or I should never have talked in this flippant, superficial way. Mr. Vice, you ought to have stopped me. And down the garden he saw Lucy herself, yes, he was disappointed. Cecil, who naturally preferred congratulations to apologies, drew down his mouth at the corners. Was this the reception his action would get from the world? Of course, he despised the world as a whole, every thoughtful man should, it is almost a test of refinement. But he was sensitive to the successive particles of it which he encountered. 
Occasionally he could be quite crude. I am sorry I have given you a shock, he said dryly. I fear that Lucy's choice does not meet with your approval. Not that. But you ought to have stopped me. I know Miss Honeychurch only a little as time goes. Perhaps I oughtn't to have discussed her so freely with any one, certainly not with you. You are conscious of having said something indiscreet? Mr. Beebe pulled himself together. Really, Mr. Vice had the art of placing one in the most tiresome positions. He was driven to use the prerogatives of his profession. No, I have said nothing indiscreet. I foresaw at Florence that her quiet, uneventful childhood must end, and it has ended. I realized dimly enough that she might take some momentous step. She has taken it. She has learnt, you will let me talk freely, as I have begun freely, she has learnt what it is to love, the greatest lesson, some people will tell you, that our earthly life provides. It was now time for him to wave his hat at the approaching trio. He did not omit to do so. She has learnt through you, and if his voice was still clerical, it was now also sincere, let it be your care that her knowledge is profitable to her. Grazie tante, said Cecil, who did not like Parsons. Have you heard, shouted Mrs. Honeychurch as she toiled up the sloping garden. Oh, Mr. Beebe, have you heard the news? Freddy, now full of geniality, whistled the wedding march. Youth seldom criticizes the accomplished fact. Indeed I have, he cried. He looked at Lucy. In her presence he could not act the parson any longer, at all events not without apology. Mrs. Honeychurch, I'm going to do what I am always supposed to do, but generally I'm too shy. I want to invoke every kind of blessing on them, grave and gay, great and small. I want them all their lives to be supremely good and supremely happy as husband and wife, as father and mother. And now I want my tea. You only asked for it just in time, the lady retorted. How dare you be serious at Windy Corner? He took his tone from her. There was no more heavy beneficence, no more attempts to dignify the situation with poetry or the scriptures. None of them dared or was able to be serious any more. An engagement is so potent a thing that sooner or later it reduces all who speak of it to this state of cheerful awe. Away from it, in the solitude of their rooms, Mr. Beebe, and even Freddy, might again be critical. But in its presence and in the presence of each other they were sincerely hilarious. It has a strange power, for it compels not only the lips, but the very heart. The chief parallel to compare one great thing with another, is the power over us of a temple of some alien creed. Standing outside, we deride or oppose it, or at the most feel sentimental. Inside, though the saints and gods are not ours, we become true believers, in case any true believer should be present. So it was that after the gropings and the misgivings of the afternoon they pulled themselves together and settled down to a very pleasant tea party. If they were hypocrites they did not know it, and their hypocrisy had every chance of setting and of becoming true. And, putting down each plate as if it were a wedding present, stimulated them greatly. They could not lag behind that smile of hers which she gave them ere she kicked the drawing-room door. Mr. Beebe chirruped. Freddy was at his wittiest, referring to Cecil as the fiasco, family-honored pun on fiancé. Mrs. Honeychurch, amusing and portly, promised well as a mother-in-law. As for Lucy and Cecil, for whom the temple had been built, they also joined in the merry ritual, but waited, as earnest worshippers should, for the disclosure of some holier shrine of joy.